Welcome back here, 13, and we are now on video two of addressing your knowledge gaps for level geography. So as you can see in video two, we are going to go through some of the post case studies in a bit of detail, and then we are also going to just quickly look at the Beerman's rank calculation. So let's start with the physical factors causing erosion on the Holderness Coast. So the Holderness Coast, as you can see from the images on the top here, it's a place where slumping and coastal erosion takes place in a dramatic fashion. So there is rapid erosion in this area of the UK, and that's because the rock along the east coast is very soft. So remember the things involved and the things to think about when we think about erosion is the lithology, so the type of rock, it's weak and soft for it. And also the structure, there is some joint, well-jointed rocks, they have a seaward dip, so they dip towards the sea, and they are heavily faulted. And some of the marine or sea factors also include the fact that there is a long wave fetch along this coast with destructive waves, and there's a strong longshore drift all the way along the coast, which helps the collapsed sediment move along that coast. And we also looked at briefly the Nile Delta. Okay, and this is for human factors causing erosion. Remember the Nile Delta, we're talking about Egypt, and it flows from Sudan and Egypt, route through Cairo and out to sea. And human activity has a major impact on erosion. So the construction of the Aswan High Dam on the River Nile in 1964 did reduce sediment volume, but erosion rates jumped 20, from 20 to 25 metres per year to over 200 metres per year. As the delta was starved. We also have dredging taking place further down the river and this removes sand and gravel from the bed of the river but that actually increases erosion rates because there's less drag on the river. Now back to the Holderness Coast. So we've already briefly mentioned the geology of the Holderness Coast but it's made up of very soft boulder clays and they've been left behind after the Venzian ice sheets about 2,000 years ago. And they're being eroded rapidly by the sea. Boulder clay is structurally weak and it has little resistance. It produces sloping cliffs, as you can see in the image, and massive fault lines or cracks. The chalk also surrounds the boulder clay. It's much stronger, but it has been eroded away. So the softer clay is now exposed and being eroded quite quickly. We also have mechanical weathering taking place, like hydraulic action, abrasion, and also freeze thaw weathering occurring here too in part winter. So therefore, over time, mass movement, including rotational slip. You can see that very clearly in the image on the bottom right. This cliff is suffering from rotational slump or slip. And quite. A bit more on the Holderness Coast then. So there are variations in coastal recession, depending on the different factors that you're carrying. Wind direction and fetch is one. So we have onshore winds here with long fetch ranges. We have a large area of sea to the east coast. There are strong winds which increase the destructive waves and that increases coastal recession. For example, the wind from the east produces recession rates of around eight meters per year on that coast and in Holderness. Seasons are also important. So the UK's rate of recession is faster in winter due to stronger storms and a mixture of warm and cooler air. In Holderness, in winter, two to six metres of erosion takes place. We also have to remember the tides. So high tides create more rapid recession rates. There's a greater impact on the coastline. And this increases the local sea level or the isostatic sea level. It means there is higher erosional rates when there are high tides along the east coast at Holderness. Finally then storms, so low pressure events like storms or depressions produce high energy destructive waves and they increase erosion rates. We also have the idea here on the bottom right as you can see in the image of a wave cut platform and you can see this wave cut notch that has been eroded out of the side and this happens a lot along the east coast and you can see of course, that you have the idea that the cliff above becomes unstable and falls into the sea. 
We also had another case study for this section, and this was on sea level rise in Tuvalu. So we've got a couple of things just to point out here. So the height of Tuvalu is only about one to two meters above sea level. Tuvalu in the Pacific Ocean is no more than five meters above sea level along the whole of the island, and it only has a population of 11 and a half thousand people. Small geographically, most people live along the coastline, so they suffer from seawater encroachment regularly. They suffer from seawater flooding very regularly. Now, we do have um, subsidence on islands like Tuvalu, and it occurs very naturally, naturally on these types of islands. So because they are low-lying coastlines, too much human activity on the landscape causes this weight to put pressure on the sand, and it therefore slopped. There is also the fact that we have drainage for soil and agriculture, the weight of the built environment, compressing sediments and so on, and it's all leads to that subsidence. And in terms of vegetation, plants on Tuvalu, in the past Tuvalu has experienced some removal of vegetation. And this was for things like farming and agriculture, but more recently, afforestation has started to take place, as you can see in the image below. And this is to try and reduce the flooding of the island nation so that the trees can soak up that excess water and reduce as much flooding as possible. So Tuvalu is a good case study for sea level rise and the impact of sea level rise in a place. But just a reminder that Tuvalu we have also used as an environmental refugee case study. So environmental refugees, just a reminder, are those that are forced to leave their home due to natural processes like landslides or flooding or rising sea levels. So the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change predicts that sea level rise of 26 to 8 centimetres by 2100 would have a severe impact on island nations such as Tuvalu in terms of flooding and salt water encroachment into both groundwater, drinking water, irrigation water and water. Tuvalu, as we said earlier, is mostly one to two metres above sea level. So what's happening is, what's been set up is essentially New Zealand has decided that it will grant residency to Tuvalu citizens each year, 75 of them, under the Pacific Access Category ballot, rising sea levels decrease its land area. And in 2014, New Zealand courts granted one family, particularly permanent residents on their basis of climate change refugees. There is this idea of climate change refugees coming into force. Obviously, by 2100, this will be a much bigger issue where more and more of the 11,500 people living in Tuvalu will have to move to nations such as Japan and New Zealand. Another bit of a case study here for you, and there's two different ones on screen coming up now, and these are the impacts of storm surges. Okay, now very unlikely you'll be asked this, but I want to cover it anyway. So remember, a storm surge is a temporary rise in low sea level produced when a depression, storm, or tropical storm. So there were two examples we looked at very briefly, and they were Bangladesh tropical cyclone Cedar in 2007 and Storm Xavier in the UK in 2013. And I'm not going to read through all this, but essentially, you need to be aware of some basic impacts of these storms or as a result of tropical storms or depressions. So in Bangladesh, we have a tropical storm, obviously. Category four, six meter storm surges. Deforestation, for example, made this worse. Percent of people in Bangladesh are low lying areas, or 60% of Bangladesh is a low lying area. 15,000 were killed, 55,000 were injured, and 1.6 million lost their homes. So, and the estimated total damage here was 1.7 billion. US dollars. So we can see that these tropical cyclones causing storm surges play a massive role in coastal recession and coastal problems. Storm Xavier in the UK in 2013. In this case, there were two people killed because of the 80 mile an hour plus wind and a three to six meter storm surge. 18,000 people were evacuated, 14, 1,400 homes were flooded, and railways were cancelled and suspended, etc. So, even though the UK one there didn't have as much of an impact, obviously, because it's less low lying, less bad a storm, we still have storm surge issues even in the UK. 
Again, back to um, case studies a bit briefly, back to the holder net again as a good example. These are the social and economic losses caused by coastal flooding and storm surge events. Okay. So in the UK, in Holderness Coast, a developed nation, social impacts are property prices falling, 30 villages losing their, um, losing, um, their status, really, since Roman times because of the disappearance of the coast. Lost farmland, lost homes, difficult to get insurance to cover it, and also people not being able to afford the repairs. In terms of the economic impacts of coastal flooding and storm surges in Holderness Coast, tourism numbers have dropped over 30%, outward migration from the area of young people, loss of infrastructure, um, expensive hard engineering schemes put in place to try and protect the area like sea walls, and also existing defences like groins at Mapleton near the Holderness area has also been damaged. So more investment needed there as well. I'm just going to put Bangladesh on screen as well, just to give you a comparison to look at here. This is a developing nation. So the social impacts there, as you can see, are at least 10.5 million people being displaced and moved on to another area. We have other problems like drowning, landslides, diarrhea, diseases, killing 100,000 people and also large scale home loss. In terms of the economic impacts, obviously farmers suffer heavily because they mainly farm along the coast. In Bangladesh, destroyed 150 million US dollars in aid needed, 290 million US dollars of crop damage in 2004 alone, and damage to schools and hospitals as well. So as you can see, there's lots of different social and economic impacts due to coastal flooding and storm. And the final thing on the coastal case studies is this, which is the winners and losers in a conflict. As you can see here, we've got the Blackwater Estuary, which is in Essex, and we've got the Maldives. Now, the Blackwater Estuary is an example where all stakeholders agreed on the course of action. The farmland was prone to flooding. Over 30 years, it had become unsustainable. So the radical plan was the Essex Wildlife Trust purchased one of the farms, which was a threatened area, and also a 4,000 acre, or sorry, 4,000 hectare managed realignment scheme was implemented. The benefits of that were that the farm owner received the market price for the farm, there was a high hold the line cost, and they were avoided. The water quality improved, there was new parts and walkways for leisure and tourism. Everyone was a winner in this case. In terms of the Maldives, there was rapid unplanned coastal development, urbanisation and development of tourist resorts in the Maldives. The main losers here are the poorest people, obviously the farmers and the residents of the area. They can't claim compensation because they have no formal land title. Coastlines are becoming more vulnerable because of sea level rise, particularly in places like the Maldives, and individual property owners, property owners have had to take out um responsibility for their own properties due to the absence of proper planning for the area so they are examples of winners and losers in conflict because of sea rises and coastal recession or erosion both in essex and the maldives okay so something very different now spearman grant calculation a number of you are still not confident with using spearman grant. now remember when you are giving it in an exam, most of it is completed for you. Okay, so this is not, obviously I'm gonna do the whole one from scratch. In an exam, most of it is completed for you. You are always given the formula and all you've got to do is punch in some numbers into the formula. Know how to use your calculator. Be able to show how you worked it out. So a couple of things to remember. When you do get your final score, the closer your calculation to plus one, stronger the positive relationship between the two sets of data. The closer the number you finally get to minus one, stronger the negative relationship between the two. In this case, we are looking at districts of Manchester, their average house price versus antisocial behaviour incidents. Now remember, we rank lowest to highest, 
So the lowest value is one, the highest value is 10. Then we work out the difference between the two ranks and then we square the total. I'm gonna rank it now and show you what it should look like. As you can see, number one here for rank one is Manchester East because it's 80,000 at average house price. That of course is the lowest on the list, okay? Number 10 then is Didsbury, 294,000 because that's the highest on the list. Your rank two, number one is Didsbury as it has 118 antisocial behavior incidents. Number 10 is Salford with 151 antisocial behavior incidents. So I've done nothing special there. All I've done is ranked one to 10, average house price, and then antisocial behavior. The next thing you need to do is get the difference. Okay, so that is the difference between both ranks. So that's very easy. You take one away from the other. So 10 minus one is nine, eight minus two is six, Six minus three is three, seven minus one is six, and so on. You put the difference all the way down that x column. And then again, the next thing you do is you square that difference. Nine squared is 81, six squared is 36, three squared is nine, six squared is 36, all the way down. And then finally, to get the total at the bottom there, and this is sometimes what you'll have to do in an exam, you'd be asked to total it. So the first step is you just add up all of those different squares and you get 272 in this. So that is the first part done. You then need to use your formula, which is on screen. And let me just go through what this formula means. RS, Spearman's rank, equals one minus, and then you have to create your fraction, six, Multiply by d squared over n, which is the number of data sets you have. In our case, it's 10. So 10 bracket or multiply by 10 squared minus one bracket. So let me show you what that looks like. That would look like one minus six multiplied by 272 over 10 multiplied by 10 squared, which is 10 by 10 minus one. So what you get then get is one minus 1632 over 990. When you punch that in on a calculator. And then you have one minus 1.6485 when you calculate and work that out. So you're left with the one minus. Obviously, you take the one off. Minus 0 0.645 in this case. Let's go back to our rule. The closer to minus one, the, the more negative the relationship. The closer to plus one, the more positive the relationship. Okay. So we have a minus 0 0.6485. And that means there is definitely a negative correlation. Okay. And that negative correlation basically says that the higher the house price, the less antisocial behavior there is. And actually, we can look back at the data. Highest house price, Didsbury, has the lowest antisocial behaviour. We take the lowest house price, Manchester East, of 80,000. It doesn't have the highest antisocial behaviour, but it has a high antisocial behaviour. Okay? So we can actually check as well that that kind of makes sense. So that is how you calculate experiments. That is it for this video. So that is addressing the knowledge, knowledge gaps video two. Please go over to video three where you can see on, in green there at the bottom of the green what we will cover in that.